Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. And remember, context is everything. Context is everything media network founder and CEO, John Michael, reading a textbook cover to cover in order to build my historical context. Um, let's do the review from yesterday. We're in chapter nine, which is the high middle ages. High middle ages are from 1050 to 1450 AD. Here are the notes from yesterday's chapter nine, section four, titled Gothic Architecture and Its Cultural Context. It's mostly about other things than Gothic architecture, but I wanted that to be a shorter title. Medieval universities began to spring up around 1100s to train clergy and men for the growing royal bureaucracy. Salerno and Bologna in Italy were the first sites of universities in Europe. Paris and Oxford soon followed. By the 1200s, universities became more common in large cities. Women were not included in education except for rare exceptions like Christine de Pizan. Um, the seven liberal arts that were studied back then, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, music, grammar, rhetoric, logic. Rhetoric is an interesting co topic because my understanding of it is there's three rhetorical concepts. Ethos, which is the credibility of a speaker, pathos, which is the emotional content of a speaker's speech, logos, which is the logical context of a speaker's speech. Ethos, pathos, logos, very important. Christian scholars were known as scholastics. Their method was known as scholasticism, scholasticism and used reason to support Christian beliefs. The most prominent of scholastics was Thomas Aquinas, whose monumental work, Summa Theologica, examines Christian values in the light of reason. And he is referenced by reasonable people who are observing Christianity from a third-person perspective, not being in it, uh, looking at the virtues of Christianity. So his work still holds up at least to people who are thoughtful today. Christian scholars studied Hippocrates on medicine, Euclid on geometry. Europeans adopted the Hindu Arabic numerals over the clunky Roman numeral system they had used before. Medieval literature, heroic epics recounted songs of heroic deeds. So these are types of storytelling in this era. So you have songs of heroic deeds or heroic, heroic epics, epic poems perhaps. Dante's Divine Comedy was written by the Italian poet Dante Alighieri and examined the Christian views of the afterlife in narrative form. Probably should put a date that it was written in, but let's keep reading. Geoffrey Chaucer, another monumental work of the era, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales, which followed a band of English pilgrims as they traveled to Thomas Becket's tomb. Thomas Becket, assassinated by uh, Henry II, I believe, um, and martyred as a saint. This book contains many stories which gives insight to the daily lives of medieval British people. That's the Canterbury Tales. Uh, in architecture, monasteries and cathedrals were built in two forms during this period in Europe. First, in the dark, oppressive Romanesque style, whose roof was so heavy that architects feared building windows. This resulted in a gloomy, dark aesthetic. Because it was all built of stone, you see. And when it's built of stone, stone roofs need to be supported by very strong stone walls. And they thought, well, we build windows in these massively thick stone walls to support the massively massive stone ceiling. The windows might be structural disintegral and cause a problem. So they said, no windows, just little 
openings like this so you get a little trickle of light. Then the flying buttress was invented. The flying buttress is like a, uh, it's like this, F like grounded into the floor and supporting up against the side of a building. The flying buttress allowed large, large, okay, the invention of the flying buttress allowed for later architects to support massive weight of stone roofs. This made windows not only possible, but an opportunity for profound artistic expression. Massive stained glass windows were cons uh, we consider from the medieval era are thanks to the innovation of the flying buttress. This is called Gothic style, and it was adopted into paintings by the 1300s. Context is everything. Five minutes and 50 seconds, becoming a trend, about six minutes on the notes. You can read all of those notes if you'd like. Look at them as reference in the description of the previous video. Chapter 9, Section 5. So we're in the High Middle Ages. Ch chapter 9, Section 5, page 225. A Time of Crisis. Setting the scene, in autumn of 1347, a fleet of Genoese trader ships loaded with grain left the black seaport of Caffa and set sail for Messina, Sicily. By mid-voyage, sailors were falling sick and dying. Soon after the ship, ships tied up in Messina, townspeople too fell sick and died. A medieval chronicler described how many people, in, uh, how the people of Messina drove the Genoese in all haste from their city and port. Nevertheless, the sickness remained, and a terrible mortality ensued. Within months, the disease that Europeans called the Black Death was raging through Italy. Europeans in the mid-1300s and the end of to Europeans in the mid-1300s, the end of the world seemed to have come. First, widespread crop failures brought famine and starvation. Then, plague and war deepened the crisis. Europe eventually recovered from this disaster. Uh, still, the upheavals of the 1300s and 1400s marked the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the early modern age. The early modern age. The Black Death. First heading. In 1348, the Black Death reached beyond Italy to Spain and France. Let me grab my sticky notes from last chapter so I can know what notes I will write about in the notes at the end. Okay. Black Death, 1347 Genoese ships. Okay. I should go to the dollar store and buy a dollar's worth of sticky note these, you know, little strips, so that I can just keep them in the chapter with easy access, so that, uh, I don't know, the book can be useful as a reference later on. Why not? Okay, Black Death, 1347, reached Europe. One in three people died. One in three people died worse than any war in history, the mortality rate. A global epidemic. The sickness was the bubonic plague, a disease spread by fleas and rats. Bubonic plague had, plague had broken out before in Europe, Asia and North Africa, but had subsided. One strain, though, had survived in Mongolia in the 1200s. Mongolian Mongol armies conquered much of Asia, probably setting off a new epidemic or outbreak 
of rapid spreading disease. In the pre-modern world, rats infested ships, towns, and even the homes of the rich and powerful, so no one took any notice of them. In the early 1300s, rats scurrying through crowded Chinese cities spread the plague, which killed about 35 million people there. 35 million people in China in the 1300s. Fleas jumped from those rats to infest the claw of... Fleas jumped from those rats to infest the clothes and packs of traders traveling west. As a result, the disease spread from Asia to the Middle East. Terrible reports reached Europe. India was depopulated. India was depopulated. Wrote the chronicler. Mesopotamia, Syria, and Armenia were covered with dead bodies. In Cairo, one of the world's largest cities, the plague at its peak killed about 7,000 people per day. Social upheaval, subheading. Social upheaval in Europe, the plague brought terror and bewilderment as people had no way to stop the disease. Some people turned to magic and witchcraft for cures. Others plunged into wild pleasures, believing the world was soon to die. Still others saw the plague as God's punishment. They beat themselves with whips to show that they repented their sins. Christians blamed Jews for the plague, charging that they had poisoned the wells. The whole world, a French friar noted, rose up against the Jews cruelly on this account. In the resulting hysteria, thousands of Jews were slaughtered. Whew. Normal life broke down. The Italian poet Boccaccio, Bocca, B-O-C-C-A-C-C-I-O, Boccaccio, the Italian poet Boccaccio described the social decay that he witnessed in Florence as people tried to avoid contracting the plague from neighbors and relatives. In the horror thereafter, brother was forsaken by brother, and, after t and oftentimes husband by wife. Nay, what is more, and scarcely to be believed, Fathers and mothers were found to abandon their children unattended, unvisited, to their fate as if they had been strangers. I'm going to read it in English this time. The po Italian poet Boccaccio said this about the horrors of the bubonic plague. In the horror thereafter, brother was forsaken by brother, and oftentimes husband by wife. Nay, what is more, and scarcely to be believed, fathers and mothers were found to abandon their own children, unattended, unvisited to their fate, as if they had been strangers. That's Boccaccio from the Decameron, Decameron, D-E-C-A-M-E-R-O-N, Boccaccio. Economic effects. Subheading, economic effects. As the plague kept reoccurring in the late 1300s, the European economy plunged into a low ebb. As workers and employers died, production declined. Survivors demanded higher wages as the cost for labor soared. Inflation or rising prices broke out too. Landowners and merchants pushed for laws to limit wages. To stop rising costs, landowners converted croplands to sheep raising, uh, which required less labor. Villagers forced off the land sought work in towns. Their guilds limited apprenticeships, refused to accept new members, and denied journeymen the chance to become masters. Coupled with the fear of the plague, these restrictions sparked explosive revolts. Bitter, 
angry peasants rampaged in England, France, Germany, and elsewhere. In cities, too, artisans fought, usually without success, for more power. The plague had spread both death and social unrest. Western Europe would not fully recover from this effect for more than 100 years. New heading. So after we're done talking about the bubonic plague, I think. Upheaval in the church. The late Middle Ages brought spiritual crisis, scandal, and division to the Roman Catholic Church. Many priests and monks died during the plague. Their replacements faced challenging questions. Why did God spare some and kill others? Asked survivors. Divisions within the Catholic Church. Subheading divisions within the Catholic Church. The church was unable to provide a strong leadership needed in this desperate time. In 1309, Pope Clement V had moved the papal court to Avignon. A-V-I-G-N-O-N. Avignon, right? Avignon. Avignon. In the border of southern France. There it remained for about 70 years under the French domination. This period is often called the Babylonian captivity of the church, referring to the time when the ancient Israelites were, helped, were held captive in Babylon. In Avion, Pope, popes, reside, popes reigned over lavish courts. Critics lashed out against the worldly pleasure-loving papacy, and anti-clergy sentiment grew. Within the church itself, reformers tried to end the captivity, captivity of Babylon, meaning Jerusalem held by the Muslims, I think. In 1378, reformers elected their own pope to rule from Rome. French cardinals responded by choosing a rival pope. For decades, there was a schism or split in the church as two and sometimes even three popes claimed to be the true vicar of Christ. True vicar of Christ. Not until 1417 did the church council at Constance finally end the crisis. New heresies. New heresies. Subheading. With its moral authority weakened, the church faced still more problems. Popular preachers challenged its power. In England, John Wycliffe, an Oxford professor, attacked church corruption. Wycliffe insisted that the Bible, not the church, was the source of all Christian truth. His followers began translating the Bible into English. So that people could read it themselves rather than rely on clergy to read it. Czech student, C-Z-E-C-H, Czech student at Oxford carried out Wycliffe's idea to Bohemia, what is today the Czech Republic. Is that still what it's called? I think it is, right? There, Jan or Jan Hus, J-A-N, there, I'm going to call him Jan, there Jan Hus led the call for reform. The church responded by persecuting Wycliffe and his followers and suppressing the Husites, people that followed Hugh and his writing of the Bible. Hughes was tried for preaching heresy, ideas contrary to the church's teachings, was found guilty, and was burnt at the stake in 1415. Folks, that ain't good. The ideas of Wycliffe and Hughes survived, however. A century later, their uh, other reformers took up some... A century later, other reformers took up the same demands, meaning making the scripture more accessible to the common folk. 
The 100 Years War. There's a new heading, 100 Years War. On top of the disasters of famine, plague, and economic decline came a long, destructive war. Between 1337 and 1453, England and France fought a series of conflicts known as the Hundred Years' War. Hundred Years' War. Causes of the Hundred Years' War. As you have read, English rulers had battled for centuries to hold unto the French lands of their Norman ancestors. French kings, for their part, were intent on extending their own power in France. When Edward III of England claimed the French crown in 1337, war erupted anew between these rival powers. Once fighting started, economic rivalry and a growing sense of national pride made it hard for either side to give up the struggle. I wasn't listening to what I just read. I don't know what I just read. <laughs> Weird. I haven't used the sticky notes at all. That's going to make writing notes a little bit more of a trial. Well, no point in starting now, right? Okay. I'm going to read the causes again because I didn't listen. As you have read, English rulers not had battled for centuries to hold on to French lands of their Norman ancestors. French kings, for their part, were intent on extending their own power in France. When Edward III of England claimed the French crown in 1337, war erupted anew between these rivals. Edward III. Once fighting started, economic rivalry and a growing sense of national pride made it hard for either side to give up the struggle. English victories subheading in Hundred Years' War. At first, the English won a string of victories at Cressy, C-R-E, with an accent, C-Y, C-R-E accent, C-Y. In 1346, the English won at Cressy. Poitier, Poitiers, 10 years later, and Agincourt, Agincourt, in 1415. They owed much of their success to the long bow wielded by English archers. This powerful new weapon was six feet long and took years to master. But it could discharge three arrows at a time. A French archer with his crossbow fired just one. Oh, but it could discharge three hours in the time that a French archer could and his crossbow could fire just one, and its arrows pierced all but the heaviest armor. The English victories took a heavy toll on the French morale. England, it seemed, was likely to bring all of France under its control. Then, in what seemed to be a French miracle, their fortunes were resolved. Joan of Arc and French victory. Joan of Arc and French victory. In 1427, a 17-year-old peasant woman, Joan of Arc, appeared at the court of Charles VII, the uncrowned king of France. She told Charles that God had sent her to save France. She persuaded the desperate king, the desperate French king, to let her lead his army against the English. To Charles's amazement, Joan inspired the battered and despairing French troops to fight anew. In an astonishing year of campaigning, she led the French to several victories and planted the seeds for future triumphs. Joan paid for success with her life. She was taken captive by allies of the English and turned over to her enemies for trial. The English wanted to discredit her and they had her tied, a uh, tried, for witchcraft. They had tried for witchcraft. She was convicted and burned at the stake. Much later, however, the church declared her a saint. The execution of Joan rallied the French, who saw her as a martyr. 
After Joan's death, the French took the off offensive with the powerful new weapon, the cannon. They attacked the English held castles. By 1453, the English held only the port of Calia, Calais, northwestern France. So, from 1337 to 1453, the English took control and lost control of a lot of French land. Effects. The Hundred Years' War set France and England on different paths. The war created a growing sense of national feeling in France that allowed French kings to expand their power. During the war, English rulers turned repeatedly to Parliament for funds, which helped that body win the power of the purse that we talked about like a week ago. The loss of the French lands shattered English dreams of continual uh, continental empire. But English rulers soon began looking at new trading ventures overseas. The Hundred Years' War brought many challenges to the late medieval world. The longbow, the cannon, gave common soldiers a new importance on the battlefield and undermined the value of armored knights. Castles and knights were doomed to disappear because their defenses could not stand up to the more deadly fire power. Feudal society was changing. Monarchs needed large armies, not feudal vassals, to fight their wars. Looking ahead. In the 1400s, as Europe rediscovered... In the 1400s, as Europe recovered from the Black Death, other changes occurred. The population expanded and manufacturing grew. These changes, in turn, led to increased trade. Italian cities flourished as centers of shipping. They sent European cloth to, medieval, uh, to the Middle East in exchange for spices, sugar, and cotton. Europeans developed new technologies. German miners, for example, used water power to crush ore and build blast furnaces to make cast iron. The recovery of late Middle Ages set the stage for further changes during the Renaissance, Reformation, and Age of Exploration. As Europe grew stronger over the next few centuries, it would take a more prominent role on the global stage. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and remember that context is everything. My name is John Michael Monroy, He's founder and CEO of Context is Everything Media Network, reading a textbook cover to cover to build my historical context. Have a good day. I hope you enjoy it. It's snowing over here. <laughs>